Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's Global International Tax Services Leader. You can watch these podcasts on YouTube at youtube.com slash Doug McConey. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, we're at Westminster Studios in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm excited to have Aaron Jung back on the podcast. Aaron is an international tax partner in PwC's Washington National Tax Services office. Before joining PwC, Aaron was tax counsel for the House Ways and Means Committee during the implementation of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Aaron, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Doug. Delighted to be here. Well, I had started changing some of the intros of my podcast because I was questioning whether U.S. tax reform was going to happen, our U.S. tax reform 2.0. I will tell you what we're going to be talking about today is wildly different than what I thought we would be talking about however many months ago when Build Back Better kind of came in. But we'll get to that in a minute. My first question before we get going here is, welcome to St. Louis. Have you uh, have you been to St. Louis before? Hey, thanks, Doug. I, I have. Um, it was about 15 years ago. And just, just to let the audience know who they're dealing with here, it was for an accounting competition during my undergrad we were uh, pr- presenting uh, proposals about teaching financial literacy to uh, younger students. So Very cool. Um, well, all of that, that accounting background, I know you and I both share an accounting undergraduate in common as well as going to law school. We're spending a lot more time thinking about accounting type of concepts in Pillar 2, and we're going to get to that very quickly here in the book Minimum Tax. Um, I was actually joking that I, I actually took one of my accounting textbooks off of my office <laughs> shelf to refresh myself on some deferred income tax accounting principles within the last year. So, yeah, I don't think you're alone there. Right, There's been a lot of this going around. A lot of uh, accounting concepts for us for us tax folks. So, um, maybe just one follow up question on on your visit to St. Louis as as an accountant. So you've been in D.C. now. You got your LLM in Georgetown. You've been in D.C. for a little over 10 years. What do you miss about the Midwest now that you're like a inside the Beltway kind of guy now? So, so I'm, I'm not inside the Beltway. Right. I live out, out in the Burbs. Okay, um, noted. Got, got a little bit of land, right? We're, right? You know, we're from Nebraska, so or I'm from Nebraska. Um, you know, what I miss most, honestly, I, I miss my family and I miss the people. Uh, and, and there's wonderful people in D.C. I mean, there's wonderful people everywhere, sure. but... Uh, um, Good, good, good people in eastern Nebraska. So, Well, welcome back to the Midwest. It's nice to, nice to have you back, Aaron. Glad to be here. All right, so let's get into the material at hand. So on Friday, August 12th, 2022, the House passed the Inflation Reduction Act, a bill including tax, energy, and health care provisions that arose from the ashes of the proposed Build Back Better Act reconciliation bill. This was all following closed-door discussions from Senator Schumer and Manchin, which I think took many of us, if not everyone, by surprise. So after some last-minute changes because of Senator Sinema and the need to get all 50 Democrat senators on board, both the Senate and now the House have passed the bill, and it currently awaits the signature of the president, which is expected shortly. I'm guessing that that will be signed before we actually even get this podcast out. So we're not going to get into some of the details of the of the energy and some of the health care provisions, but really it's the cross-border tax talks. So I wanted to focus on the tax provisions. Aaron, what are some of those key tax provisions from the Inflation Reduction Act? Well, probably the signature tax changes in the bill are actually the green energy items. I think that's that's probably what the members would point to first. But on the revenue raising side, there's a few. Um, the biggest revenue raiser um, is the new book minimum tax. It's a corporate alternative minimum tax. I think we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about here today. Mm-hmm. Um, besides that, there are a few others. Um, there is a new excise tax on stock repurchases or stock buybacks. There's a two-year extension of the excess loss uh, activity limitations for individuals. And then there's over $100 billion of additional funding for enforcement over 10 years for the IRS. Um, which doesn't doesn't score from a joint committee on taxation revenue raising perspective, but absolutely is going to raise revenue for the fisc through IRS enforcement. Yeah, and just to put those those numbers in context, I think, uh, and I'm not sure if these are the latest or the final numbers, but for the 15% book minimum tax, JCT had estimated over 220 billion over 10 years. 
for the 1% excise tax, it was 74 billion. And then the two year extension of the excess business loss rule was 53 billion. So some, some significant numbers there. So what we wanted to do today is really focus on the book minimum tax um, or, or the new AMT. I guess the first question is, Aaron, what should we call this thing? Is it the book min tax? Is it the, the book AMT? Do you have any thoughts here? We're, it's still an early, we're still early in the game. So I'm gonna call it the book minimum tax because I think that best describes how people think about it, right? It's a minimum tax, minimum tax based on your book income. It actually is an alternative minimum tax by design, and it's actually replacing the old corporate AMT that was repealed in 2017 as part of the TCGA. But I, I got to admit, when I've been reading reports and I see the CAMT, I don't even know what I'm reading about, right? So book minimum tax is kind of where I've been landed on this And I, I actually prefer the acronym BMT because it does differentiate it from the old AMT. But I think your point is, is that it operates in an AMT and that it's kind of a minimum threshold. And then you can also carry it forward in the future if you are paying actually regular corporate income tax. So it operates very similarly to the AMT. Yep. So one question, we're going to actually get into some of the details here, but the most common question that I have been getting from taxpayers, fellow advisors, other is like, is this the U.S. version of the Pillar 2, either QDMTT, UTPR, I've heard a bunch of different questions, but is this, Aaron, the U.S. Pillar 2 top-up tax? No. There's a lot of acronyms in Pillar 2, and this isn't any of them. Right. It's not a Pillar 2 tax. I mean, the truth is, this policy grows out of um, longstanding concerns on the Hill that you open up the Wall Street Journal and there's an article saying, you know, pick a big company just reported their, their financials and they've got, you know, X million or X billion of book income and they're paying this percentage effective tax rate. And why is that? I thought our statutory rate was 35 or 21 or whatever it is at the, at the time people are concerned. And so it really is growing out of that. Now, there are some similarities with Pillar 2. It's a 15 percent rate. Right. And there's, you know, a book connection there and it is a minimum tax. Right. You can't pay less mm -hmm. than this. Um, but no, it's not a it's not a uh, pillar two tax, It's not a qualified domestic minimum top up tax. It's not an income inclusion regime. Um, I think there's some interesting questions about how it will fit into the pillar two math. Right. And I think we need to see how that plays out. But no, this is not the U.S.'s attempt at a pillar two rule. Yeah, and, and your point on that, well, yes, it does happen to be 15%. There are the minimum taxes in the title. Yes, we're starting with financial accounting um, sort of standards to, to start the calculation. But the, the, the BMT, the book minimum tax, it predates anything similar to even the UTPR or the qualified domestic minimum tax. And so this really was an invention that came out well before this concept of the QDMTT within Pillar 2. But you can certainly understand how people are confused given the timing and some of the, the common characteristics. And I think you're right, and we'll cover this a little bit later in the podcast. It will be interesting to see sort of how this thing progresses. Um, I say this thing, how the book minimum tax and how it interacts with, with Pillar 2. All right, so um, maybe we start with when is this effective? And then we'll, we can talk about what companies are impacted. Next year, tax years beginning after 2022. So for calendar year taxpayers, 2023 is the year they have to start worrying about potentially paying it. There actually is a little bit of pre-effective date thinking to be done because you test whether you're subject to it looking at three years before 2023, and you also consider pre-2023 net operating losses, and we can get into that later. But 2023 is the first calendar year where you can be paying book minimum tax liability. So fourth quarter companies are are going to need to 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 think about this for those calendar for those calendar year taxpayers and companies. And they may even want to start thinking in the third quarter. And they should probably start thinking about it immediately. And we're going to explain yeah. why. But uh, so what are what companies are actually impacted by this? And so what are these applicable corporations? Yeah. So applicable corporation is the kind of defined term for being subject to it. At a high level, it's a company that has over a billion dollars of book profits before taxes. Um, now, the way you compute that is you do a three-year average. So you look at the three years before the tax year in question. So think 2020, 2021, 2022. If on average, you're what's called adjusted financial statement income. For now, let's think about it as book profits before taxes. We can talk about the adjustments later. If that exceeds a billion dollars, you're in the soup. Now, there is a special rule if you're what I'll call an inbound company, a foreign parented multinational group. So if you've got a foreign corporation at the top of the structure of your reporting group, there's an additional threshold that you have to meet and you have to meet both. So the entire group has to be, be above that billion dollar threshold. 
In addition, when you look at just the U.S. subs of that group and any CFCs, any controlled foreign corporations underneath them, they need to be above a $100 million threshold, right? And so the idea is we're only targeting, or excuse me, Congress is only targeting big companies with this proposal. But if you're a big foreign company, you need to have a sufficiently sized U.S. presence to get into the rule as well. And that's why there's that second threshold for inbound companies. Yeah, so the, the I think the, the concept is this would be a much smaller subset of companies than would potentially be impacted. Again, we're going to compare with Pillar 2, which is 750 million euro, but that's revenue, right? And this is PBT. Um, there were there have been some estimates floating around. I think we've also we've seen from from another number of commentators, and I think maybe it was the House Ways and Means or remind me, somebody had mentioned, somebody I think as part of the process had said that this was intended to impact 140 companies. Yeah, the, the staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation had okay. thrown out 150 companies being affected, right? You know, it's going to change year to year. But, you know, what that's really aimed at is this is about how many companies that they think, based on the data they have available to them today, are going to pay the tax. There's probably, you know, well over a thousand companies that need to be thinking about whether they're in the rules and running the calculations every year, right, to see if they're going to be one of those 150 at the end of the day that has to pay the tax liability. So it's intended to be a small number of companies that actually pay the liability, but it's going to be a broader scope of companies that have to start doing the testing, the compliance, the tracking, all of that. Yeah, because you got to do the math to figure out if you're in the soup or, or if, if you're not. Um, you know, one of the, the issues that kind of came up as part of the negotiations, if you will, the, kind of the public, I should say, negotiations that the Democrats, the Senate Democrats were doing as part of this was, um, you know, exactly what, what companies this might apply to, including whether this could potentially impact private equity and whether you would test at the fund level or whether you would test at the portfolio company level. And there were some changes to those aggregation rules. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what is in scope versus out of scope? Obviously, the big, you know, publicly traded companies potentially are in the soup, but how does that work with in, in the private equity space and asset management space? Yeah, so, so just take a step back here. I mean, the shorthand is the entire group needs to be above that billion-dollar threshold and the $100 million threshold if it's an inbound group. But the question is, well, what is the group, right? Is that, you know, who shows up on the consolidated financial statements or is it something else? And, of course, there is a definition in, in the legislative text, and it's based on relationships. It's based on ownership relationships um, between different entities. And there was a concern that uh, under a prior draft, um, of the bill that you could have potentially separate companies that share common ownership through, for example, a private equity fund, having to test that applicability in the aggregate across all those separate companies. So imagine a private equity fund has a controlling interest in um, you know three or four or five different companies, N and not any one of those is above the billion dollar threshold, right? They might be a few hundred million each, but when you add them all up, then they are above a billion. Right? And the concern was, well, look, we're really only trying to aim at you know, those bigger companies. Why are we picking up smaller companies that just so happen to be under a common investment structure? And so that change was made to intend to um, relieve some of those concerns. Now, I will say it's still very fact-specific, mm -hmm. and it really depends on how the fund is structured, what's the nature of it, what's the nature of the ownership, entity classification, and so forth. And so I, I would strongly encourage folks um, that are in those circumstances to take a hard look at the legislative text that finally came out of the Senate and the House um, and compare it to their structure and see whether or not they could be an applicable corporation, right? And just do that averaging test and make sure they, they know what their status is. Yeah, and one of the things I think for listeners to note, and we'll, we'll cover this a bit more later, is that there really is broad regulatory authority um, for a number, for most of these provisions, right? And so, you know, frankly, similar to the TCJA, we're not going to know exactly as advisors and taxpayers what some of those rules are until some point in the future when the regulations are written. And I would assume this, amongst a number of the other provisions, will will be covered and we'll get more detail as kind of time, time goes by. I, I assume so. And, and I'd remind folks, so, you know, there's legislative authority for regulations to go retroactive to 18 months after legislation passes. But there's also, as we saw in TCGA, authority for regulations to be retroactively effective for tax years ending after the first day that the public becomes aware of that guidance. And so really, we could get proposed regulations December 30th of next year, and they could be finalized a year or two later, 
and all of that could be retroactively applicable to the first year that this law is effective. Now, I'm confident Treasury and the IRS are going to try to get guidance out before folks file their returns, mm-hmm. right? They always do. But it's just it's just a word of caution that it could be, just like you said, it could be six months, 12 months, 18 months before we have a lot of these questions answered. All right. So let's turn to the the calculation and then, you know, want to go through some of the mechanics of the calculation. Then we can talk about the AMT carry forward and how does that compare to the regular tax liability. But we have a whole new concept that has been introduced called adjusted financial statement income as kind of our starting point for this calculation. Aaron, what the heck is adjusted financial statement income? Yeah, it, it's actually pretty complicated. So, so the, you know, the cliff notes is you open up your audited financial statements and whatever is your net income or loss on that, plus some adjustments, that's your adjusted financial statement income, which sounds easy, but nothing ever is. And these rules contemplate that you're going to compute that adjusted financial statement income on a buy entity basis. But of course, your financial statements are almost always filed on a consolidated basis. Particularly for U.S. GAAP taxpayers, as we've learned, particularly as we've talked a lot about here on the cross-border tax talks, as we've thought about Pillar 2. So this, But this really is a new, different concept than what we've been talking about with Pillar 2. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so completely agree with you on that. And, and I would just kind of purge Pillar 2 from your mind for a moment because it really is a separate set of books that we're talking about here. You start with those consolidated financials, and the first thing you do is you disaggregate them on a per-entity basis, and right away you've got a question. Well, what about all those intercompany transactions that I eliminated along the way? What do I do with those, right? And and that's that's the kinds of questions that Treasury is going to need to answer in regulations as we go through this process. But the starting point is that net income or loss number on the consolidated financials, and then we make adjustments from there. Yeah, and to your point is what is that opening balance sheet for purposes of this calculation will be a complex process for companies to go through just being able to access the systems data and then being able to do the adjustments trying to obviously automate those adjustments to then do the calculation this is it's it's kind of mind-boggling to me but another set of books that you know multinationals are going to have to keep to be able to do this calculation so um, let's talk about some of the the specifics, some of those I guess common adjustments um, that 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 w- we've seen that are included in the definition. One of the ones that was talked about a lot as part of the legislative process was this concept of accelerated depreciation, and the concern was, you know, this is a very common book tax uh, uh, timing adjustment, right? With accelerated depreciation available from a tax perspective that could put some companies potentially in the book minimum tax soup. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so this is actually one of the most recent changes that happened in the last few weeks as this bill was moving through uh, the legislative process. But you start with your financial statement income, and then for tangible depreciable property is how I'll shortcut it. Um, there's, it's specifically referencing code sections 167 and 168, but tangible depreciable property. Um, Effectively, you ignore the book treatment of that, and instead you take into account the tax treatment of that. And what, that, what that's supposed to do is mitigate a book tax difference that potentially could have driven a minimum tax liability. Because when you think about it, if your starting point is book income, and you're comparing whether 15% of that is greater than 21% of tax income, well, any difference between book and tax income is what's going to drive a liability. And depreciation, cost recovery, is a huge source of that because there's just very different... Um, cost recovery schedules for book and tax purposes, in part because they're driven by very different considerations, right? And yeah, I'll, I'll stop after this, but I'll, I'll just note one of the biggest drivers on tax depreciation is 100% bonus depreciation, a signature part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And it's not unique to the TCGA. Bonus mm-hmm. depreciation has been around for a long time as 100% or other percentages intended to drive investment, right? That's a tax incentive to drive investment. Book is different. Book is measuring cost recovery for you know the, the useful information of, of stakeholders. And so trying to correct that is what this adjustment is doing to ensure you don't have effectively a clawback of that incentive of, of accelerated depreciation under the tax code. Right. And, and, and you pointed out that that only applies for purposes of 167. So if you have 197 amortization, I think generally with except with with one exception for wireless spectrum that generally that 197 amortization is is effectively not a good adjustment for purpose of the BMT or in other words could reduce your overall taxable income percentage under the BMT. Yep, absolutely. And it, as you know, I mean that's a good change for wireless spectrum because in many cases those could be a definitely live assets. 
and you may not get book amortization, but that's true of other intangibles as well, where you may not get book amortization, but you get tax amortization. There again, you're gonna have book tax differences potentially driving a book minimum tax liability. Right. Um, all right, so so talk about how, how is this calculation done? Let, let's start maybe with disregarded entities and then CFCs. Yeah, so like I said, you start with your consolidated financials and you break it down on a per entity basis. And from that, you take all the entities in the consolidated group, all the U.S. corporations. That's your starting point. You then add to that disregarded entities owned by consolidated group members. You add to that that are distributive share or partnership net income or loss, falling up into the consolidated return. You also add to that certain amounts with respect to non-consolidated subsidiaries, right? These could be CFCs. These could be non-consolidated domestic corporations. These could be non-controlled foreign corporations. Um, you add to your adjusted financial statement income dividends from those entities. You also add any income or deductible loss that's taken into account for tax purposes. So if you have a gain or loss with respect to those, for example. What you don't pick up, though, is subpart F and guilty inclusions because those get taken care of in the next step, which is for CFCs. So we've started with a consolidated group. We've added disregarded entities, partnerships, non-consolidated subsidiaries through dividends and gains. The next thing we do is we add in our pro rata share of the net income or loss of any CFCs, right? And we'll do that as adjusted under these rules. So if there's disregarded entities or partnerships under the CFCs, that flows up into the net income or loss of the CFC. And then the U.S. shareholders pro rata share of that gets added into adjusted financial statement income. Now, one thing you might have noticed as I went through that, might not have since I went through it so fast, is CFCs are also non-consolidated subsidiaries. Right. Which means both that rule for dividends from non-consolidated subsidiaries all and also the net pro rata share of net income or loss of a CFC can apply concurrently. And if you're tracking at home, that's double counting. Sounds like it. Drafters noticed this, right? I'm sure plenty of folks highlighted to them as well, and they added express regulatory authority for Treasury to eliminate double counting as part of that. So I think that's that's an example of really important regulations that Treasury will be working on. But I think it also raises a lot of questions about, well, what is double counting? Right. For example, let's say a U.S. multinational buys a foreign target, and that foreign target, after the acquisition, pays up a dividend. Is that double counting to pick up that dividend in the adjusted financial statement income of the U.S. group? when the net income or loss, the earnings from which that dividend is sourced, was never picked up in that U.S. group's book minimum tax tax base, was never picked up in that U.S. consolidated group's adjusted financial statement income, but maybe it was picked up by someone else, by the sellers, right? Right. Those are kind of edge cases that Treasury is also going to have to think about as they're exercising that regulatory authority and fleshing out the guidance the taxpayers will rely on. All right. What about, um, I mean, there were some other uh, kind of quirky uh, adjustments to, to think through and maybe just get your thoughts on a couple of those. First of all, defined, pen, defined pension benefits. Yeah, huge issue um, and, and actually was addressed um, after the House passed Build Back Better last year. Um, the Senate um, was, was taking up Build Back Better before uh, negotiations came to a halt for a period of time. And as part of that, Senate Finance Committee had released um, updated text that, that would have included an adjustment to the book minimum tax for pensions. What the adjustment does is effectively it takes off everything that book did for defined benefits plans, and there's a definition in there of what, what we're looking at, and it puts the tax treatment on instead. And so just like the depreciation was trying to do is eliminate the book tax difference so you don't have... Uh, book minimum tax liability incurred with respect to your pension plans, whether it's the funding, the investment growth, or what have you. What about financial statement losses? So, and, and those can be at the at the consolidated parent, but then also what happens when we have losses down at the CFC level, for example? Yeah, so, so there's actually several issues related to financial statement losses. The first one I'll just note, and this is kind of a super secret rule, is you can have negative adjusted financial statement income in any particular year. So when you're thinking about that three-year average, you need to take into account your loss years as well. If you're a loss-making taxpayer for a number of years, you may not be an applicable corporation for some amount of time just because your three-year average isn't ab above a billion of profit, mm -hmm. right? You may be a huge company, but if you've been running losses, until you get out of those losses, you just won't meet the threshold. Once book losses. Book losses, right. that's right. Yep. And once you get out of those losses, um, there is the ability to, to deduct um, book net operating losses against your adjusted financial statement income in future years. They carry forward indefinitely, 
They can be deducted up to 80% of your adjusted financial statement income, so you can't completely eliminate your, your book minimum tax liability with NOLs. You can only take into account, like you said, book net operating losses and only ones that arose after 2019. So like I said at the beginning, there's a little bit of backward looking to be doing here. You mm -hmm. want to go back to 2020 and ask yourself, do we have any losses there forward? Because they could be relevant for our calculation. Now those are net losses across the entire adjusted financial statement income. You also mentioned CFCs. Mm -hmm. There's two things I'll note here. The first thing I'll note is, I said earlier you pick up your pro rata share of the net income or loss of a CFC. That's true, but I didn't tell the whole truth. If the net income or loss is zero or positive, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. If it's negative across your CFCs, you cap it at zero and the excess carries forward to next year. So you can't use CFC losses to reduce book minimum tax liability on U.S. income. Instead, it just carries forward to the future and you might be able to use it in the next year to reduce potential book minimum tax liability on CFC income. The other thing I'll mention, though, is that's a one-way street. So CFC losses can't offset U.S. income. U.S. losses can offset CFC income. So if you have positive net income in your CFCs and losses in your U.S. operations, you still net them all together, mm -hmm. which means your total adjusted financial statement income could be less than your total CFC income. And when we get to the foreign tax credit, what we'll realize is that means you could actually be effectively wasting those net operating mm. losses against the CFC income because you were going to get a foreign tax credit to use against that income, but instead it was offset by the losses and you don't carry those losses forward. Yeah, there's no concept of kind of the ODL recapture or the similar type of, at least yet, right? Well, not not yet. Not yet. Maybe that's a bit, it's time to start advocating for, for that. Man, it's already just insanely complicated, yeah. right? Yeah. Like just... Um, it's a great point, something that I haven't haven't given a lot of thought to, but you know, certainly just how to manage all these different carry forwards kind of as a and separate, you know, as a separate calculation will be challenging for, for advisors as well as uh, as taxpayers. Absolutely. So so talk about let's step back because I do want to then come to the AMT, the, the BMT foreign tax credit, but just just to put a little context, once we've done these calculations. How do we determine whether a company is actually paying this book minimum tax? And then how does that kind of work forward if you are, if a taxpayer is in the BMT soup, as you described? Yeah, so you go through, compute your adjusted financial statement income, you multiply it by 15%, you subtract from it an a, a book minimum tax foreign tax credit, which we'll talk about, and then you compare that amount to your regular tax liability. And when I say regular tax liability, what I mean is your regular tax reduced by foreign tax credits, plus B, but without reduction for any general business business credits. So R&D, green energy, those things don't get taken out. If the AMT minus AM, there, I'm falling back into it. <laughs> if the book minimum tax minus book minimum tax foreign tax credit is greater than that regular tax amount I described, the excess is what you pay as well. So the idea is you never pay you, you always pay the greater of the two, right? But you'll never pay less just because the book minimum tax liability is lower. One thing I'll note is you'll notice that I said the regular tax is not reduced by GBCs, is not reduced by general business credits. That was really important for the drafters of this, of this bill because they want to preserve the value of those general business credits, right? They don't want to be, you know, creating hundreds of billions of dollars of green energy incentives and then immediately claw them back with some kind of book minimum tax that treats them as a preference item. So the, the value of those are preserved under this calculation. And you know, I would be remiss, I cannot help, I'm, we're trying to keep the pillar two separate from this, but this is, right, th th this policy reason for making these general business credits kind of good taxes, if you will, for purposes of the BMT, is exactly the problem that we have with that the fact that they're non-refundable for purposes of the pillar two and not good covered taxes. And so I've gotten that question from from a number of folks already. And you know, it's just kind of we can compare kind of that pillar two versus the BMT. And I think this is a very important distinction distinction and that understandably the least the, the U.S. we were thinking from a policy perspective to make sure that the R&D credits and those other incentives like the green energy credits are good credits and could don't kick a taxpayer into the BMT. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And, that, and that's probably the primary, primary reason why I would say that this is not a pillar two tax because of the right. way it treats non-refundable incentive credits like R&D and so forth. 
Okay. So let's move to the, the, the foreign tax credit for purposes of the book minimum tax. And this is something I remember I spent a lot of time early in my career doing some tax returns and do, doing with the, the old AMT foreign tax credit. Um, so tell us about this new BMT foreign tax credit. How does that work? Yep. So there is a BMT foreign tax credit. And of course, it's calculated completely separate from your regular foreign tax credit. So you need to be tracking it separately. Um, the, the starting point is credible foreign income taxes. And so if you think about, and, and you've been talking about this on cross-border tax talks as well, we had recent regulations under the foreign tax credit rules for regular tax purposes defining what is a credible foreign income tax. Those continue to control here, right? So whatever Great your credit... Whatever your credible foreign income taxes are, for regular tax purposes, that's the starting point for your, your book minimum tax foreign tax credit. There's kind of two components of the book minimum tax foreign tax credit. There's what I'll call direct taxes, and then what I'll call indirect or CFC taxes, right? So direct taxes are taxes that show up on the taxpayer's financial statement, are paid for, ta for regular tax purposes. Those foreign, ta those foreign income taxes are credible, and there's no limitations in this bill on those. Separately, there's indirect or CFC taxes, and those are the foreign income taxes paid by your CFCs. Those are also part of your book minimum tax foreign tax credit, but they do have a limit. And the limit is 15% of your pro rata share of the net income or loss of all your CFCs. And remember, that net income or loss is grossed up or you add back foreign income taxes, mm -hmm. right? Just kind of like the Section 70 gross up right. under regular tax rules. So you're not getting a deduction and a credit for it. You got to. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. But that, that that's the only limitation that's on that foreign tax credit. There's no basketing. There's no 901 JKL and M. There's no 909, no expense apportionment, none of that. There's just one limit, which is that limitation on 15% of the CFC foreign taxes. The idea is kind of like the CFC losses. You can't use excess foreign income taxes on CFC income or loss to offset book minimum tax right. liability and other income. You can go the other direction, right? Non-CFC taxes can offset book minimum tax liability on CFC income, but not the other way around. CFC taxes cannot. Yeah, and again, it's blended across the various, so just an, an, another sort of as we're distinguishing this from pillar two, right? That's just another distinction is that this allows all of those CFCs to be aggregated, you know, through blending, not by baskets. Uh, but you're, I'm going to go back to the initial point is that, you know, you do have to look at what is creditable under the U.S. standards. And so, you know, one of the jurisdictions that we spend many a lot talking about is Brazil, for example. You know, presumably those credits just fall outside, you know, until they, you know, change their rules. I think there's risk, I guess I should say, that those credits just fall completely out of the of that calculation for purposes of determining your, your foreign tax credits. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And it's really easy to look at this and say, oh, well, you know, if the foreign effective tax rate on my CFC earnings is at least 15%, I'm good to go. And in many cases, that'll be true. But you do want to take into account just what you said. Think about Brazil. Think about withholding taxes on services and some royalties, right? Any of those taxes that may not qualify for a foreign tax credit, once you take those out, your foreign effective rate may fall below 15%. And now you might be looking at BMT exposure on your CFC operations as well. Okay. So let's kind of get to the the punchline and um, the couple of, one other procedural point that I want to raise. But is this really just a, a big timing difference? I mean, Aaron... So what? Well, so you raise a really good point, right? Because, and, and we haven't mentioned it in, in great detail so far, but if you pay book minimum tax, you are allowed a book minimum tax credit against future regular tax liability. Indefinite doesn't expire for the full amount, which means eventually, if, you, if you're paying enough regular tax, um, you will recoup the book minimum tax that you paid. And then that way you might look at it as a tax, as merely a timing difference. There's a couple things I'll say on that. Um, the first is some folks, just based on their industry, based on the way they operate, may persistently be in a book minimum tax position. They may never pay additional regular tax against which they can use that credit. For them, sure, they have a carry for it, but it's just going to keep stacking up year after year, and it's not going to have any value associated with it. For other folks, they may be able to re recoup that credit eventually. But it could take a while. It could take three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. At some point, timing differences start to feel a lot more like permanent differences mm -hmm. because they're real cash outlays and they're real, they're real um, limits 
on your ability to make investments, on your ability to, to build out expansions of, of factories or R&D facilities or what have you. And so that cash outlay, they lose that ability to, do, to make those investments, even if it's a timing difference and they'll recoup it later. There's one other thing I'll say here, and I, I know you've got a lot of thoughts on this too, Doug, but I think it's worth thinking about how this interacts with Pillar 2. Mm-hmm. And I've tried very hard to just tell everyone to purge your mind of Pillar 2 when we're talking about this. Which I've been completely incapable of doing during this podcast. It's okay. I, right. I, I think you've been trying, which I appreciate. Uh, I have. But once you have a... So, so I, I agree that the book minimum tax is not a QDMTT. I think it's probably a covered tax for Pillar 2 purposes, which means when you pay the book minimum tax, it counts towards whether you have enough tax to prevent pillar two top up tax. But once you claim that AMT credit, I think that's probably a reduction of your covered taxes in the year that you claim the credit, which means you're looking at potential incremental pillar two exposure in the year that you claim that credit. And so it might feel like a timing difference from a book minimum tax perspective. It might even be a timing difference from a book minimum tax perspective, but it's not a timing difference from a pillar two, pillar two perspective. And what you've done is If you pay book minimum tax in 2023 or 2024, and then you carry that credit forward to a year where the UTPR applies and you have pillar two top-up tax in the year that you claim the AMT credit, basically you've just prepaid your pillar two liability in 23 or 24, and it will be a permanent difference once once the other side of that's collected. That is such an important point, Aaron. And I've read a number of articles from various commentators. I have not seen that really raised and that you know, I, there's been plenty of discussions um, about, including on this podcast, about you know refundable credits, and as we think about R and D, for example, we've had we've we've wasted plenty of uh, oxygen on on that issue, um, and that that's it's a you know it's a, it's a non-refundable credit. It's not a good covered tax. I think the way I'm thinking about this is that this book minimum tax, similarly, if you pay the tax to your point in 23 and then try to carry that forward. Well, in that future year, when you use that, that is not a good cover tax and you could end up in the the pillar two soup. And so it's really important to really be able to triangulate between your, your US corporate income tax, your book minimum tax and your pillar two, because what you pay in 2023 could certainly impact what you could pay from a UTPR perspective or even an IIR if you're a foreign parented company, what you may pay in 24 or 25. So very, very important for, for, for companies to understand that. I think the other point that's interesting is that to the extent that it is a covered tax, presumably the tax that you pay with the book minimum tax relative to the U.S. earnings is a covered tax for the U.S. And then I would assume that any taxes that you pay under the book minimum tax associated with your foreign earnings should then get kind of pushed down as a CFC tax but I don't know if that's entirely clear either, but it would seem equitable at least. Yeah, it, it seems like splitting atoms to me. I mean, I, it's gonna be very, it, it does seem equitable. It seems like the right answer and it seems like an approach that folks should consider whether other countries do that. And to be sure, it's a matter of foreign law. It's not a matter of US law, right? If another country Im- implements an IAR or a UTPR and they wanna give credit for taxes imposed under the book minimum tax as a CFC regime, their law needs to split out how, how you allocate those taxes between the two. It seems like a challenging process and uh, something that we definitely want to see guidance for. Right. Okay. So a couple of other things want to kind of cover here. Um, maybe, the, the, and I, this is more of a question because I know you spent a lot of time, you know, when you were at uh, House Ways and Means as an attorney there, as part of the TCJA, and I'm sure that these have happened in the past and I just wasn't as focused on the legislative process, Um, but this concept of a a colloquy and that that happens during the legislative process. And I think there was at least one where there were, we had a lot of questions from both advisors, taxpayers, um, that was settled, if you will, and I'm probably overstating that, but Aaron, for, for our listening audience, what is a, a colloquy and what does this mean? And then what is the specific one that is relevant for this book minimum tax? Yeah, so a colloquy is a statement between two members of Congress on the, on the chamber floor. It can happen in the House, it can happen in the Senate, but it happens on the floor, on the record. One of them will be up to speak as part of the debate before they vote and they will yield part of their time to another member to have a conversation about an issue that's important to them, right? And it can be on any number of topics, and there have over the years been a few on tax issues. Now, the importance of it is it's in the congressional record, right? It goes in, it goes into the official record, 
And it's also something that occurs before they vote on the bill, which means it's part of the legislative history, right? If you look at the kind of jurisprudence around legislative history, it's anything that the members had available to them at the time they went to vote. And so if the chair, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee or the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, right, who are looked at in their respective chambers as kind of the go-to person for tax matters since they chair the tax writing committee, if they have a conversation with another member of the chamber about how a tax provision works, the members that are voting on that bill can look at that and say, hey, look, this is what this provision is supposed to be doing, and I'm going to vote yay or nay with that in mind, right? So it can have some impact as far as legislative history. I think as a practical matter, what's intended to do is flag issues that the members want to see addressed in the regulatory process. Mm -hmm. And we saw a couple of those in TCGA. For example, there was a colloquy on the Senate floor about the services cost method and how it applies in the context of the beat. And there were later regulations that addressed the services cost method consistent with that colloquy. There was also a colloquy about downward attribution under the CFC rules, so-called Section 958B4 repeal. There were never regulations in introduced consistent with that colloquy. So it's kind of take it or leave it, right? It, it, you know, potent, it's out there, it's in the record, it can be taken into account, but it doesn't mean that Treasury will follow it. There was a handful of colloquies over on the Senate side in respect to the book minimum tax, um, several of them addressing, again, things that members want to see accomplished through the regulatory process. There's one in particular I think is worth keeping an eye on, and that is a colloquy between Chairman Wyden and Senator Cardin around how does other comprehensive income factor in here, right? Other comprehensive income is income that doesn't show up on the income statement of the financial statements, but does get taken into account when reconciling the shareholder equity. And you might have thought, well, boy, that's not part of net income or loss because it's not on the income statement. But back in the 80s, there was a corporate AMT that had a book earnings adjustment, and there were temporary regulations issued under that provision. That provision also looked at net income or loss on financial statements, and those temporary regulations did take into account items that reconcile to shareholder equity, including items that now show up on other comprehensive income. So I think that colloquy is really important because what the, what the chairman was saying is, look, the way this is written, other comprehensive income is not part of your adjusted financial statement income. That was the expectation of the Senate senators as they voted favorably on the bill, and something that Treasury may take into account when it's writing future regulations. Well, we certainly hope so, because that, you know, particularly OCI, oftentimes from a foreign exchange perspective, and what a volatile environment it's been for FX, I mean, what it, just at any time, but particularly it's acute now, given what's happened with markets, um, I'm optimistic that we will see such regulation. All right, what other regulations, and I know they gave us a whole list, but any kind of highlights from a regulatory perspective? I mean, it seems to me, and this is kind of a trend, as where they, they give a lot of express authority, they being Congress, gives a lot of express authority to, to Treasury to write regulations. What, what should we be mindful of for the, for the BMT? Well, like I said, it's a very broad list, and there's a catch-all in there, which is anything uh, consistent with the, or anything to further the purposes of the provision. So a very broad grant of regulatory authority, but there are some that are specifically called out. So we talked about double counting in the context of CFCs. There's also authority to address ownership changes. Think about M&A activity, right, where you might have um, one group that used to be in the billion-dollar threshold that isn't anymore after the ownership change or vice versa. Um, there's also authority to, to address um, equity accounting, deferred, mm -hmm. deferred tax accounting, right? Think about, you know, do I take into account only my current taxes? Do I also add back deferreds? Do I take credit for those deferreds? Um, so any number of those items, plus, you know, whatever else is coming in the door over at Treasury, I think will be addressed by regulations. I, I would say, and this is just kind of a plug for folks to be thinking about, um, once the bill is passed, I would encourage folks to go in and talk to Treasury about the concerns they have and mm -hmm. help Treasury understand what issues are out there. Treasury is going to want to make, Treasury and the IRS are going to want to make these rules work. They can only work with what they know. Right? And they don't know every fact pattern out there. They're not able to see every company's unique facts. And so it makes a lot of sense to go in and talk to Treasury and the IRS, share with them your concerns, and talk to them about ways that they can make this bill operate the way it's intended to operate through regulations. I think that's great advice. I mean, really just trying to engage in the process. And because this kind of, I feel like it snuck up on, on taxpayers a bit, given just the nature of... We weren't sure what was going to happen with Build Back Better. I think many of us just thought that that was going to be in the 
in the history books and then it kind of revived here with the BMT and I'm just not sure as much maybe us as as commentators as advisors and taxpayers were were quite as focused on this really becoming a reality and, and it is now so you're, that point is very well taken as far as engaging in the discussion what other advice do you have for companies here in closing to as we think about this this book minimum tax and heck you could even throw in the the one percent excise tax but as, as we think about some of these corporate law tax law changes as a result of the inflation reduction act yeah, the, the, the thing I would recommend is folks dig in and start modeling out what they think the impact of this is going to be to them. Model out, do you think you're an applicable corporation? What do you think your adjusted financial statement income is? What do you think your book minimum tax liability is? And I would really encourage folks to do that at a more granular level. I wouldn't do a back of the envelope calculation for a couple reasons. One, you know, there's a number of detailed adjustments that are being made here. And it can be surprising sometimes how they play out in practice. Um, and two, you're going to end up needing to file, you know, comply with these rules in very short order here. Right. Again, I fully expect it to be signed in the law in the next week or so, and you know, probably before the podcast is, is released. And so folks are going to have to comply with this for provision purposes, mm -hmm. for tax return filing purposes. And so I would get a jump start on that now because it's going to be difficult to get geared up for it and at the later end of the process with you know a whole new set of books a whole new set of concepts to be thinking through and to be sure things will change through the regulatory process but the folks that have gotten on it on the front end will be much more much better suited to adapt or address those changes as they come they'll also be able to think through what they should be talking to the government about to make sure that these rules operate the way they are intended to operate. Yeah, for taxpayers, there's an operational readiness aspect of this too. Do you have the right people? Do you have the right resources? Do you have the right data? Because getting to that applicable financial statement income is going to, to come with some challenges, right? To be able to create that kind of opening balance sheet as we described earlier. So really good advice, Aaron. Always great talking to you. This is not what I expected right when for us to be talking about here at the at the end of the first two years of the Dems controlling the House, the Senate and the executive branch. But here we all well, here we are talking about the book minimum tax. And when I say I'm excited, I'm just excited to talk about something besides pillar two, honestly, but yet I still couldn't get away from that. So thanks a lot, Aaron. Oh, thank you, Doug. It's been great. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Aaron Jung, an international tax partner in PwC's Washington National Tax Services practice. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's Global International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.